is the record label OVO sound or is it really Drake's sound? On the flip side of that argument, is it fair to get sucked into the conspiracy theory that artists on OVO are putting their personal career secondary to that of Drake? Look, Drake is clearly the most successful mainstream rapper singer out now. He's carving a solid spot so deep into the Billboard charts that some weeks it seems to consist of only Drake and a small handful of others. But when it comes to OVO sound, it often seems like there's only room for one superstar on the label, Drake. What exactly is going on with OVO? And why does a record label with the most popular performer in the world seem to be plagued by a history of issues? Noisy wondered the exact same thing about OVO in 2016 when they stated, It's looking like the dream they're selling is sexy art direction and clutch credits on the boss's albums. OVO Sound is excellent at the business of making Drake albums, but not yet the no-brainer star-making force up north it could be, possibly because the tightest songs get run up the pipeline and placed at the feet of the Six God. It's nothing new in the rap game for new artists to climb up the ladder with the upward mobility of getting co-signed by a much bigger established hip-hop artist. In all fairness, Lil Wayne did the same thing for Drake by crowning him as the next guy to watch out for through guest appearances and taking Drake on his tours. Brooklyn rappers Jazz O and Big Daddy Kane did the same for Jay-Z. Jay-Z did the same for Kanye West, and Kanye West did the same for Kid Cudi. But in all reality, who has Drake signed or co-signed that has risen up to that level? Or would stand on their own to expand the OVO brand without needing Drake close by? Don't take this the wrong way. Drake has definitely given huge opportunities to hometown talent from the Toronto area. He even attempted to co-sign Toronto's The Weeknd early on in that man's career, but The Weeknd repped his own EXO brand instead, and is arguably just as big as Drake now. We have all heard of other Toronto area singers like Party Next Door, Majid Jordan, and Roy Woods because of OVO. But how much non-Drake success have these OVO signees been able to achieve since joining the label? Party Next Door has the most instant name recognition and the most musical output of the four acts, releasing two albums and four EPs on OVO Sound. But when you crunch the numbers, none of Party's projects have even come close to cracking the gold or platinum mark. On the single side, Party Next Door has one gold-selling solo song, The Infectious Not Nice, from his Party Next Door 3 album. The only platinum Party Next Door single right now is Recognize, with the help of Drake as a featured guest. When Drake dropped, if you're reading this, is too late, he used PND's Wednesday Night Interlude. During a Rolling Stone magazine article, it seems as though Party Next Door was unsure if that was his best solo career move. I was involved with that tape. Drake asked for that song. I said, are you going to cut it? No, he just put it on there. I don't think people do that. I love the fact that he put it on there and people heard it, and I still to this day wish I kept that song for my album. Moving down to OVO roster, signed the same year as Party Next Door in 2013, is Majid Jordan, the Canadian R&B duo of singer Majid Al Mascati and producer Jordan Ullman. Their biggest moment in music so far has been Hold On, We're Going Home, the triple platinum wedding anthem that they co-wrote and co-produced for Drake. Majid and Jordan's collaboration so far are one EP and two albums deep, without a gold or platinum project or single to speak of outside of their country of Canada. In 2015, OVO Sound brought on singer and songwriter Roy Woods, who is almost a decade younger than Drake, so he has plenty of time and energy left in him. But out of his two EPs, one mixtape and one studio album, zero hits have emerged. Then the mysteriously marketed two-man R&B crew division, consisting of Daniel Daly and 1985, have released a pair of albums September 5th that peaked at 17 on the Billboard US R&B and Hip Hop charts, and its follow-up called Morning After then peaked at number 22. Oddly enough, OVO has yet to sign any rappers or female artists, not even the kind that raps and sings like the dual talent that Drake has mastered. There is, however, a powerful crew of in-house producers that have become name brand sound providers in their own rights. 40, Boy Wanda, 1985, and T-. The difference between the signed producers from the signed singers is that the beat makers seem to have the freedom to spread their wings and stamp their sound onto artists outside of the OVO sound stable. Between 
opportunities for producers, major performers have benefited from their tracks, such as Alicia Keys, DJ Khaled, Eminem, Nicki Minaj, Rihanna, Justin Bieber, and Lil Wayne, just to name a few. But even with their versatile workflow and client list, in most cases, their biggest hits have still been reserved for Drake. Speaking of OVO producers, the closest creative partner that Drake has is Noah Forty Shabib, who allegedly was disgruntled about notoriety and things evolving Drake, according to Drake's verbal adversary Pusha T. When Push participated in an extensive exclusive interview with the Joe Budden podcast in 2018. During the midst of the Pusha T vs. Drake sound clash, an old contributor to the OVO sound movement, specifically the Drake mixtape if you're reading this is too late, has had his name pulled back into the rap wrestling ring, songwriter and artist Quentin Miller. When asked by a fan about working with Drake, Quint Miller, who had allegedly been beaten up by Meek Mill's affiliates over the Drake ghostwriting controversy that fueled the Drake and Meek Mill battle, made it clear that his relationship with Drake was a strictly past tense thing by declaring, never doing anything with that guy again. I literally don't even care for that to become a thing. We're finished. He's doing him. I'm doing me. Point blank. That's it, though. Shit dead. Remember that time when Drake hopped on the remix for that I Love McConan hit Tuesday, then turned around and signed I Love McConan up to OVO Sound? Well, unfortunately, that didn't really last beyond the I Love McConan EP that dropped on December 15, 2014, and the I Love McConan 2 EP that hit eardrums on November 20, 2015, and a pair of mixtapes, Drink More Water 5 and Whip It Up tape with Rich the Kid that came out through OVO Sound and Rich Forever. But a similar story is told when you look at I Love McConan's collection of single song releases. The only platinum piece is Tuesday with Drake. Information as to why I love McConan parted ways with OVO Sound are less clear, cryptic, and eerily mysterious. During an interview, I love McConan told the fader that he had drama with Drake and the OVO Sound crew at an MTV VMAs party in New York City. I'm here in the middle of the floor, no security, and they come in and I just step to the side and they see me and stop and the biggest motherfucker in the game goes, woo, 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 next time I'm gonna fuck you up. And all security and everybody stopped like, what the fuck? And the guys with me were like, what you do? I don't have nothing to say. All I did was smile and I guess they took that as a threat. When the fader asks I Love McConan the reason why he thinks the OVO started a relationship with him in the first place, I Love McConan's answer was simple and straightforward. They needed a hot song. That's it. Moji was another Toronto rapper that was once pulled into the OVO sound fold, but was tragically folded up violently, allegedly by Drake's crew. Moji went public on Instagram about his creative issues with OVO saying, Have you ever heard in history a man that gives away his creativity and helps make billboard hits, but doesn't get paid a dollar or get one credit for it and is here stuck in the hood? That doesn't make sense. Moji also mentioned what he felt Drake's OVO partner Oliver wanted out of their relationship. After I did this shit, Oliver put me in a studio and he said, they need new hooks, new flows, and bars and shit. He went even further stating, I'm not a slave, only slave of Allah, not the fake ass six god. Moji's left-handed Ginobili dance was utilized by Drake in both his energy and his hotline bling videos. Then the nasty result of Moji speaking his truth transpired when Moji posted pictures of his face bloody and swollen, implying that it was allegedly the outcome of speaking out about his OVO experience. Even the OVO fest seems, in 2018, to have evolved into just a Toronto tour stop for Drake's current album. Instead of the annual musical extravaganza that featured Drake, OVO artists, and music legends like past performances from Stevie Wonder, Kanye West, Eminem, and Toronto's own OG grand lyricist, Cardinal Official. Noisy reported back in 2016 that Drake and his OVO sound partner producer Noah Forty Shabib both actually worked in a songwriting song producing capacity for Dr. Dre's Aftermath record label when Drake was only 19 years old in 2015. Apparently, the pair were paid $10,000 for their efforts and lived at the Oakwood apartment complex, known as a location for Hollywood wannabes and child actors. This information originally was inside the published book called The Song Machine, Inside the Hit Factory by author John Seabrook. There was actually a quote from Drake in the book about his experience behind the scenes writing songs for Aftermath where Drake stated, it was some of the most strenuous militant shit I've ever done, but no usable songs came out of it. When I think of how he worked us, it's no wonder he didn't get anything out of it. It was just writers in a room churning out product all day long. Could this early experience that occurred three years before Drake's breakthrough mixtape So Far Gone was released have inspired the structure for the music making boot camp for OVO Sound with a community of songwriters and producers giving up goods to get the glamour, gold, and Grammy awards?
With the OVO Owl and the black and gold brand colors still filling up apparel merchandise and used to promote the OVO radio show and other entertainment side hustles, will OVO ever be bigger than Drake so that it can become the Motown records of Canada that it could truly be? Also, will there be enough marketing, hit songs, and artist branding and development put into other rappers and singers to become as big as Drake so OVO can become the greatest retirement plan ever, allowing Drake to jump back into acting full time whenever he feels like it? I guess we'll have to find out. This has been a Hip Hop Madness original. Make sure you stay tuned and stay up to date on everything we got going on by subscribing and making sure you hit that notification bell. And don't forget to follow us on Instagram at Hip Hop Madness and join the movement.